Hello, everyone. Welcome to the very last day, or rather the very last session of day two. And what an extraordinary day we've had together. My name is Amy Huang, and I'm the University Innovation Manager here at the Good Food Institute. I'm joined today by two of my wonderful teammates, Arjun and Christina, who will help us reflect on the remarkable day we all just shared together. After we take a few moments to reflect on the key takeaways that inspired us today, we'll center our discussion on exploring, hopefully together with all of you, the question, what will it actually take for alternative proteins to feed the world? And then I'll wrap up with a preview of the many exciting sessions we have in store for tomorrow. Um, so why don't we kick it off with a quick round of introductions. Arjun, do you wanna tell us a little bit about who you are? Yeah, thank you, Amy. So hi, everybody. I hope you had a wonderful time at the conference today. I'm excited to chat with you during this closing plenary session along with Christina and Amy. So my name is Arjun Iyer, and I'm the Academic Community Coordinator at GFI. So in my role, I support students as they help transform their universities into engines of alternative protein innovation through GFI's Alt Protein Project. And hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Christina Aguila, and I'm the University Innovation Specialist here at GFI. In this role, I work to build education and training programs, such as courses that are focused on alternative protein. Thank you so much, both. I'm so excited to have you both here. Arjun and Christina, um, we have had quite a day. Let's take a look back at this very long, very worldview expanding day that we all just experienced together. What did you all think of today's sessions? And maybe tell us about some of the key ideas that inspired you to think a little bit differently about our work. Um, Arjun, I'd love to hear your reflections on our session today to start. And I'll just flag for our audience members, uh, while Arjun's responding, please feel free to hop in the chat with your reflections from today. What were your favorite sessions and learnings? Um, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, thank you, Amy. This day was just jam packed with exciting sessions. So we started the first session of our day in Singapore, which was in the earliest hours of the morning for me here in Baltimore, Maryland. Throughout these global sessions, I've simply been blown away by everything I learned about alt protein innovations happening around the world. For the session centered around Asia, I was reminded of the mind boggling market size and rapid demographic shifts that are happening in that part of the world. It's clear that we're in an era of global alt protein innovation, and that makes me really hopeful. I also deeply appreciated the discussion on engaging with emerging markets throughout Asia, Africa, Latin America, and beyond. There's no better time to support, invest in, and catalyze alt-protein innovation in rapidly developing nations. In addition to improving access to delicious and nutritious foods, this will also be a chance for our field to support smallholder producers in new ways and address the vast public health and nutrition-related challenges in many regions of the world. I also love the discussions around what it'll take to make cultivated meat successful in Europe. It's important to touch on key uncertainties in the field, such as barriers to success and what it'll take to achieve widespread alt protein acceptance across the board. Something I pulled away from the Brazil session, which also applies to other countries, are the opportunities for the alternative protein field to tap into regional products and native agrodiversity to support local producers and regional food innovation. A common theme I noticed across all of the sessions involved the regulatory and policy needs for the alternative protein space. And it was such a privilege to join the pitch slam and hear about the absolutely wonderful companies and their many puns, which are on the rise in the alternative protein space. Christina, are there any takeaways that you had for the sessions today? Yeah, thank you, Arjun. So I started my day with the on-ramps to innovation session where we heard from experts from other emerging fields like clean energy. And they talked about how universities weren't originally structured to focus on real world problems. So preparing students to enter emerging fields like alternative protein will, will require different educational approaches. And I've been thinking a lot about Tom Khalil's advice to major in a discipline and then minor in a problem. I was also blown away by the session on advances in media for cultivated meat, where we learned 
about the latest research on cell culture media. This included streamlining experiments through a definitive screening design and lowering the cost of media by switching ingredients from pharmaceutical grade to feed grade. And then I was so excited that the session on ingredient processing for plant-based meat highlighted two of my favorite foods as promising ingredients, which are mung beans and chickpeas. I know that overall, we're still working to achieve taste parity with conventional meat, but to think that we've made it this far with just a few crops and knowing we have all these new ingredients to explore just makes me so hyped for the next generation of plant-based products. And then lastly, I attended the grantee session where we got to hear six different flash talks from incredible researchers. I'm, I'm especially excited to see how artificial intelligence and computer modeling can accelerate research in the cultivated meat arena. So Amy, are there any takeaways that you'd like to share? Thank you so much, Arjun and Christina. I'm a little bit jealous that I wasn't able to attend all those sessions, but I'm glad across the three of us, we were able to see most. And I'm so excited to watch the recordings back for the ones that I missed. Um, yeah, I was really excited about one of the tech sessions that I um, attended on production equipment innovation. First off, was just so happy that this year we had a technical deep dive um, track this year. It, all of the sessions that I attended in that track just reiterated how important it is to engage in the open access exchange of, of our research advancements and findings because I just saw so many research collaborations springing forth in the comment section of those sessions. It was so inspiring to see. Um, in the session on production equipment innovation, we just had such a colorful array of speakers um, discussing all sorts of really nifty gadgets and devices like ultrasonic devices, the use of benchtop twin screw extruders that allow you to formulate products at lab scale, um, the use of highly specialized 3D printing technologies to produce raw salmon that's uncannily similar to animal-based salmon, um, and the 300 pieces of equipment at the Saskatchewan Food Industry Center, um, along with their 50 researchers focused on accelerating plant-based meat product development. Um, and I think something that really was underscored to me over the course of that session was just how important it is to have groups of researchers working together to close some of our critical white spaces. Um, I also loved our technical session on precision fermentation, where we learned about um, really addressing barriers to scale up um, and in some ways creatively doing so using computational cloud platforms. Um, but overall, I thought day two was just a really beautiful celebration of how far this field has come since it really started picking up just five or so years ago. And, and also, I thought it was a really powerful rallying cry for how much work there is to be done. Um, so was just really grateful um, to learn from all of the speakers, panelists, and attendees today. Um, on this last note about rallying cry, um, it is really exciting that GFI launched a new RFP centered on two priority white spaces for those in the audience who are um, itching to make further scientific progress in this space. I've just dropped the link in the chat there. Um, and then you can also read about the $5 million of open access alternative protein research funding that GFI just rewarded today as well. Alrighty, thank you so much everyone for helping us reflect on this jam-packed day. Um, Sheila agreed, a theme that stuck out for me today is also how scientists are just at the table more and more. Um, and it's been really cool to see, yeah, um, these nuanced discussions unfold. Um, I'd like to shift gears a little bit now and invite Arjun and Christina and all of you in the audience to help us reflect on what, what I think is a really critical question. Um, so we know that today, many of the activities were centered around science and technology and entrepreneurship. Um, and it's been really extraordinary to see the progress that's been made across our sector. However, when we look ahead and ask the question, what will it actually take for alternative proteins to feed the world? 
it becomes clear that the work done by these phenomenal scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs, investors in this industry must also be prepared to address the nuances of a very diverse set of social, economic, and cultural contexts and adapt to a rapidly changing set of environmental and political conditions. Um, so, so this is admittedly a pretty big, broad question. You know, what will it actually take for alternative proteins to feed the world? Um, so maybe we can start by first aligning on our interpretations of this question. Um, and again, we invite all audience members to chip in with their perspectives in the chat. Um, Arjun, what does it even mean to feed the world? How, how should we begin thinking about this question? Yeah, what does it mean to feed the world? That's the big question I'm sure most of us have in the back of our minds. And I know it's an incredibly personal question for many of us as well. In fact, for me, it's the reason that I've chosen to pursue the academic and professional pathways that I have. I think I frame this question in two ways. And first, I see this as something that expands and goes beyond my own lifetime. So my grandparents grew up in an incredibly challenging era of history as is probably the case for many of us. My grandparents were children of partition and came to India as refugees from Bangladesh. During that period filled with sectarian violence and geopolitical turmoil, nearly half of my family was lost to starvation. Learning about these intergenerational consequences of food insecurity and seeing firsthand how that affected my own family was incredibly eye-opening for me. Seeing how my loved ones, even today, are so prone to a starvation mentality with noticeable shifts in their behavior and perceptions of food has shown me how the answer to this question, what will it take to feed the world, must have a multi-generational solution. We have a global audience joining us here today from 66 different countries around the world. So I know I'm not the only one whose family has such a complicated relationship with food. The other way I frame this question is related to how food is inextricably linked to social, political, and economic ongoings around the world today. So I've spent most of my life in the US, so I've been relatively far removed from many humanitarian crises associated with food. At times, it can be hard to fully comprehend the barriers to feeding the world without actually seeing and experiencing some of those challenges firsthand. My most formative experience, I'd say, which better connected me to these challenges, happened to be while I was working as a biodiversity researcher in the Madre de Dios region of the Peruvian Amazon. So of course the rainforest and it's all of its wildlife are incredibly beautiful, but the unending encroachment of animal agriculture in the region was simply impossible to escape. From the night I arrived to the very day I left, all of the countless fires that spread across the horizon, you could literally see the forest on fire every single day and it had not stopped burning once while I was there. So it's even clearer to me now that answering this question what will it take to feed the world, specifically with alternative proteins? It will need to have a global multidisciplinary solution, one with a central focus on food security. Thanks, Arjun, for those um, extraordinary and important reflections, um, especially the personal dimension. I think you're right that with such a, a global field, with 66 countries represented, um, I, I do think that um, there's a real diversity of relationships to food. Um, I want to hone in on the theme of food security that you touched on um, at the start of your answer. We know that emerging technologies can often impact global food systems in pretty unexpected ways, um, right? So I, I know given your academic background, food security is something you've looked uh, into a fair bit. What are some of the considerations related to ensuring global food security that our field needs to keep in mind as we facilitate this food system transformation? Yeah, I first of all, I really love this point that you bring up in your question that emerging technologies are drivers for food system transformation. Emerging technologies are one of the many external drivers that are affecting the resilience of our global food system. Other drivers include climate change, globalization, demographic shifts, and perhaps most relevant to us now, pandemics. The question for me asks, 
how can we as leaders in the alternative protein space build a secure, sustainable and equitable food system in the face of all of these developments? And I think we should start by considering how we'd like to see the alternative protein field support the pillars of global food security. For example, an inability to access nutritious products is one of the greatest drivers for malnutrition around the world. How can we ensure that all individuals and households can easily access our products? And how, and how can we make sure that these products are both safe and nutritious? Also, what more must we do to support our farm workers and producers, improve upon the supply chains that we currently have in place and ensure effective distribution at regional and global levels? What will it take to make these supply chains both stable and resilient? I'd really love to hear audience thoughts and reflections on some of these questions. In what ways do you, with your unique background, see the alternative protein field promoting regional and global food security? Yeah, thanks, Arjun. I think some of the ideas you just touched on certainly resonate with some of our audience members. Um, I love that comment that Sheila had spotlighted from Eileen McNamara um, that you know the equal distribution of this really, really revolutionary set of technologies is key to feeding the world here. Um, and Chris Menzel touching on um, the many dimensions of um, our, our current food system challenges that are addressed by alternative proteins is really valuable here too. Um, yeah, I like this reflection here from Noel. Agriculture has been a critical engine of economic growth in low and middle income countries where food insecurity is so pervasive. And I think that's something um, Christine and Arjun will reflect on more as we continue our discussion. Um, I wanna pivot now to um, Christina. Um, what does this question of feeding the world mean to you? Um, and what lens are you looking through to examine this question of, of how alt proteins could feed the world? Yeah, so for alternative proteins to feed the world, clearly a lot of work needs to be done, which means we need to educate and train a lot of people. So what I think of when I think about this question is all the educational programs that need to happen globally and specifically, how do we make these educational pathways equitable and accessible to everyone? So it's not just a select group of people in rich countries who have opportunities to enter the alternative protein field. And a lot of my thinking here is influenced by my experience back in college as a woman of color studying engineering, because as the years went by, I saw fewer and fewer people from underrepresented backgrounds in my classes. So that led me to get involved with STEM outreach and other initiatives to improve educational outcomes for marginalized individuals. But the other part of my background that shapes my perspective here is the fact that my parents are from the Philippines and I was just astronomically lucky to be able to pursue my education in the United States. So from what I know about their academic journey in a lower income country, I am very aware that the inequities in global education are vastly different and much more complex than what I had experienced firsthand. So all of that is to say that to me, feeding the world in a better way comes hand in hand with educating the world in a better way. Wow, thank you so much, Christina. That was so powerful. Um, Thank you for articulating so beautifully the personal and sector-wide significance of building more equitable educational pathways. I do think, you know, the people who are driving forward this field um, need to be a, a diverse and inclusive community. Um, and I, I think as a field, it's pretty easy for us to converge on this answer that we should build a diverse workforce but actually making that happen feels a lot more complex. Um, and so maybe um, this is a naive question, but maybe you can help me answer, why is it so hard? Um, maybe you can help us paint a more nuanced picture of the structural barriers facing marginalized communities, not just here in the US, but around the world in terms of educational access and equity. Yeah, so I think that's a great question. and. One reason it's so difficult is because different marginalized groups face very different structural barriers. So I'll give three quick examples. 
Uh, let's say you're a first generation college student. Many of your classmates have their parents as a resource to help them navigate the confusing college environment, whereas you're figuring it out on your own. So you might be less informed about financial aid opportunities or useful student orgs or other campus resources. And maybe there's an additional pressure you face because being the first in your family to go to college can feel like a huge risk. Uh, so as a result of all of these factors and more, it makes you less likely to graduate. So moving on to another scenario, imagine you're a non-traditional student, meaning you didn't enter college immediately after high school. This means you might already be a full-time employee or a parent or caregiver, and now you're taking on this additional role of being a student. And if you can only attend school part-time, then you might not be eligible for financial aid. And unfortunately, most colleges still cater their student support services to traditional students, even though the proportion of non-traditional students is increasing. So all of this leads to lower rates of graduation uh, for this group as well. And then lastly, I wanna zoom out. Um, imagine you live in a rural area in a low or middle income country. In many of these places, um, primary and secondary schools lack access to basic resources such as drinking water, electricity, and the internet. So pursuing higher education is often out of the question. And this lack of infrastructure and funding presents enormous barriers to education for these communities in lower income countries. So when you consider all the different types of programs we need to launch, all the infrastructure we need to build, all the resources we need to fund, I think that's one of the reasons why achieving educational equity and truly diversifying the, work field, the, the workforce is an incredibly complex problem. Thank you so much for those reflections, Christina. Um, I loved, you know, what Eduardo had added in here as a tangible, actionable thing our field might consider pursuing. Um, coming from a middle income country, Eduardo reflects that it's hard to even study related subjects. Um, and it'd be really nice to see some greater collaborations between top universities and universities in middle income countries to advance this alt protein workforce development question. Um, I want to zoom out a little bit and, and you know, uh, join our two threads, this global food insecurity and building diverse pathways into the alternative protein workforce. Um, what is really at stake here, um, Arjun and Christina? What will happen if we don't address these barriers to feeding the world as an industry? Um, so I can start. Um, for example, if we fail to make equitable education programs for alternative protein, then we can expect to fall into the same patterns that we see currently in other fields. We'll see the same trends of marginalized groups graduating at lower rates and not finding employment, for example. And I wanna note that I know that a lot of us in the alternative protein field are here because we're motivated by wanting to do good in areas like sustainability and public health. and this might suggest that more of us are on board with diversity and inclusion than other fields. However, it's not enough to just want diversity or to passively support it. We need to actively reevaluate our existing educational systems and try new methods and programs that actually prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion if we want to see real change. Christina, I really appreciate your focus on diversity and equity here. I think that bringing in underserved and marginalized communities is incredibly important. Historically, there's just been too few people, predominantly the wealthiest and most privileges, that have defined the trajectory of our food system. Our field's in a wonderful place to do something new. Uh, and Amy, to answer your question about what's at stake here, it's clear that maintaining our current systems of industrialized animal agriculture will be devastating for people and the planet. Sadly, these practices are already in place in most high income countries and are being adopted by low and middle income countries at a terrifyingly fast pace. Industrial animal ag is actually replacing the predominantly rural and traditional food systems that exist for most countries around the world. This is going to significantly exacerbate antibiotic resistance, deforestation, biodiversity loss, 
and the farm worker uh, health related issues that already exist. The alt protein field has this unique opportunity to continue the ongoing trends of expansion and moder modernization of the global food system in a more efficient, less resource intensive and more environmentally and socially responsible way. Yeah, thank you so much, Arjun and Christina. I appreciate you both helping us zoom out and look at the systems level. Like it's clear that this spans beyond just technology um, and, and spans beyond. We have to look at all of the factors that affect um, food system transformation. Um, so thank you for surfacing these crucial considerations and for your personal reflections. Um, yeah, to Bruce's point in the chat, um, this topic was surfaced on the Brazil session earlier today too. And um, for those of you who missed it, please do visit the session recordings to watch that back. Um, I think we can all be talking about this stuff more. Um, before we uh, wrap up this discussion, I'd love to focus on um, what it will actually take to set up our field for success in terms of feeding the world, given these crucial considerations you've surfaced. So what are some tangible, actionable things the members of the alternative protein community could do now and in the years ahead to build this more equitable world that we've just spent, you know, 20 minutes envisioning? Sure, I can start with a few suggestions. So one thing we need to do um, is build clear educational pathways into the alternative protein field at schools that serve underrepresented groups in STEM. Uh, in the US, this includes historically black colleges and universities, uh, Hispanic, ser Hispanic serving institutions and tribal colleges and universities. And furthermore, we need to coordinate with employers so that they actually know to recruit from these talent pools. And then to reach more non-traditional students, we need a greater variety of education and training programs that employers see as, rep as reputable. So not just four-year degree programs, but also non-degree programs, short courses, and online courses. And then the actions that we need to take in lower uh, middle-income countries are much more difficult to coordinate, but we can learn a lot from established international organizations that focus on food security. So for example, the International Rice Research Institute has set up uh, multiple agricultural research and education centers throughout Asia and Africa. And through these, they've been able to train over 300,000 people. Uh, similarly, the International Potato Center developed a farmer business school to help farms become more profitable by supporting farmers to uh, lead market assessments and product development. And since its implementation, these business schools have reached thousands of farmers throughout Asia and South America. So these are just some examples of actions that we can take to increase educational equity and as a result, um, diversify the workforce. Yeah, Christina, I really love this international lens that you've touched on. And in a similar vein, I really firmly believe that uh, the most important step forward that we can take involves facilitating international and multilateral collaboration. So these collaborative efforts could exist in a variety of shapes and forms. But one thing is for sure, it's incredibly important to have a unified international agenda here. And I'd absolutely love to hear what the audience thinks about this. Such an agenda I feel would be most successful if world leaders, governments, researchers, educators, students, corporations, farm workers, and everybody else around the world who's affiliated with the industry identifies and aligns on what it'll actually take for alternative proteins to feed the world. And most likely through educating current and future generations, funding open access research, supporting commercialization, and aligning on policy, we could get this done. It's the most logical response to me here because there is so much potential for collaboration at local, regional, and international levels, even if different places and people have uniquely different reasons for pursuing alternative proteins. Just to share some high-level examples here, some nations like the Netherlands and Germany are pursuing alt-protein innovation as leaders in the fight against climate change. Brazil, already a global, alt pro, uh, a global protein leader, has impeccable business opportunities within the field. Other nations like India and China have multiple billion mouths to feed and unparalleled manufacturing capacity. 
And this doesn't even scratch the surface of the dozens of other nations like Israel and Singapore and more who are leading the alt protein movement around the world. I just think that convening a diversity of stakeholders is important to ensure that all voices are brought to the table and that this field grows in a just and sustainable way for everybody. So I guess to conclude this, I really believe that alignment and consensus at different scales, whether that's in your local community or in the most global stage possible, will be crucial for our field. Yeah, thank you so much, Arjun and Christina. Um, to our audience members, I hope this discussion was valuable to you as we think about how to sustainably, scalably, and equitably feed the world with alternative proteins. I certainly learned a lot from your comments in the chat. Um, and thank you so much to Christina and Arjun for guiding us through the many considerations at play here. I really appreciate all of your reflections. Well, that wraps a very mind-blowing day two. Um, the biggest ginormous GFI thank you to all of today's speakers, panelists, expert moderators, and every single participant. For any of you out there who started up, out with us more than 12 hours ago as we woke up with the sun in Singapore, an extra big kudos to you. Um, I hope you're able to get some rest today. Tomorrow, our lineup is more similarly sized to day one, where we've packed our sessions in within a five-hour window, starting at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And on deck tomorrow, we have Jessica Almi, our Vice President of Policy, kicking us off with opening plenary talks, followed by really deep, in-depth sessions focused on cultivated meats, path to market, label censorship, expert-rich panels focused on infrastructure and sensory solutions, and a session focused on alt seafood as an ocean policy priority. Please be sure to stay with us to the very end for a special live one-on-one -on -one fireside chat between the New York Times' Ezra Klein and our very own Bruce Friedrich. I am um, so excited for yet another day of programming that's brimming with insight for us to take home. Um, and I thank you again all for being here with us today um, and for engaging in this critical discussion. All right, everyone, that is officially it for day two. Looking forward to seeing you all bright and early tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Yeah.